There's a question there with Luke. Yeah, maybe a very simple question because I'm just a consumer. But what is the taste of a uh, salt tolerant uh, vegetable? What is it? Uh, cauliflower or something? We should have brought the carrots. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm going to give this question to Arjen. Uh, well, it depends on the crop and also the salt tolerance of a crop. For instance, we tested also uh, cucumber and uh, okra, and they become very bitter with a specific salinity level and not nice to eat anymore. But we did a lot of professional testing with potato, and if you have the same variety cultivated under non-saline conditions compared to saline conditions, the one under saline conditions uh, has a much better taste, overall taste. It's not just some salts in the potato that uh, how do you say, amplify the taste, but there are a lot of different taste characteristics that start to improve under saline conditions. And with carrots, the sugar content goes up. So actually, if you produce carrots under saline conditions, as a reaction to the salts, the plant produces sugar. sugar. So you get very sweet tasting uh, carrots, but you also have very salty plants as well. So it depends a bit on the salt concentration you're using uh, and, and, and the salt tolerance of the crop and the part you're eating. But in general, salt concentrations in your food under moderate conditions are quite low, so there's no risk of eating too much salt. And for a lot of crops, the quality actually improves. Thank you very much. It's the carrots, huh? Remember the carrots. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, can I give... Uh, can you please introduce yourself? Thank you, Russell Miguelson from Royal Eigecam. And thank you very much for a very exciting presentation from Wageningen and from uh, the salt doctors. I am a bit confused because we are in the perfect storm. We are in 2050, we will be 10 billion. We have 400 million hectares saline agriculture. We have a solution that works actually. And we have research that shows that we need the solutions. But what is the obstacle that is scaling? Because I, I can understand we're doing pilot by pilot by pilot by country from country to country. What is the obstacles? What is the stops us to scale this and feed the whole populations? Thank you. Okay, to whom should I ask the question? Maybe, maybe, maybe our keynote speaker first. Thank you very much for that question. It's a very interesting question. So I believe that we can look at the barriers at different, uh, at different levels. First of all, as you said, we have now done quite some pilots, quite some experiments, and now it's the time to jump, to jump to the larger scale, um, well, larger scale production, also introducing it into market policies and just uh, working on a, on a global scale. And as we see that, it's also um, the matter of um, economy being ready, of the markets being there, of the customers being, pr being prepared for the taste and also curious and ready to, to try it. It's also a matter of policies. So sometimes in certain countries, it's good, it's, it's, it's nice and it's um, very desirable to have a good policy that can support it. Um, and also, finally, um, impact investors and, well, all investors being ready to invest in these technologies as well. We have now done quite some work as it comes to the research and pilots, but um, all these um, innovations and solutions, they also need capital to grow better. And maybe now I will pass to Judith. Yes, I think also I would like to thank you, Kay. I think you did already quite a elaborate story um, that we are now in a sort of transition so we are now doing the pilots and now we are moving into the more policy state and we are moving towards bigger skills. So I think we are moving there, but it is in transition. So it's a messy process and we're not, we don't know where we actually are going, but we know that we have to do something and we know the evidence is there. So I, I would say that's, uh, that's that. Would you like to respond? Or? Uh, I think uh, my mic still uh, works. Yeah, well, Razul, you know, uh, the, that, that same question we're asking ourselves all the time, because, yeah, we think the, the, the awareness is there right now. Uh, 20 years ago when we started, uh, awareness was still an issue. But now I think everything is in place to, to start scaling up. You know, of course, you have to look at the sustainability of using salt-affected land, especially if you're using saline water for irrigation. That's quite tricky, and you have to be sure it's sustainable from different perspectives. 
But still, if you look at the salinity, the, the challenges, you know, with the global salinity map, it's mentioned 1.5 billion people are living in salt-affected areas, you know, so the problem is there, and you can also regard it as a market opportunity. But why we can't take it from these relative small pilots to really the next steps of implementation and actual impact, yeah, that's very tricky, you know, it's, uh, we don't understand very well as well, yeah, the, the big money is with the big organizations, and somehow this is not on their agenda. Maybe if it's on their agenda, they start working on it. But uh, for us, it's really difficult to understand why organizations are not taking the next step. And of course, in the Netherlands, we want to be part of it, together with the consortium, work on it. But there are many players in the world that are working on it, and they have the same issues. The research is there, the pilots are there, and now the next step uh, has to be taken. But how, that's uh, the big question for us as well. Okay, if that's the big question, we are here with quite some uh, capital in the room, uh, thinking capacity. Uh, can I see hands? Who is working on this salinity issue in some way or the other? I can see some hands, but a lot of people are more kind of in the wider sense uh, related to the issue. The people who have hands up, are you working in the Netherlands on the issue or are you working internationally on the issue? International? Okay, I got all the hands back. So, and the Netherlands? Oh, only one hand left. Okay, so the majority is on the international level. Yeah. Um, if you ask a researcher if he fully understands the problem, what will the researcher answer? Well, they will give you a complex story in a very nice way, right? That's what they did. Yeah. But researchers always have new questions, right? So when you are at this uh, tra uh, transition, like what Judith is saying, we need other people than researchers there as well, right? So you need companies there, you need NGOs there, you need policy people there. And in a way, I think that that's in a way also what you would wish to do. Um, I do not know if in INSAS you have that experience. I know from the research that Judith is involved in, they're for instance working with Solidaridad. Now, Solidaridad is an NGO working on uh, ensuring farmers about income and uh, not kind of destroying the environment. But so in this transition, you will need different parties there. So that's it then in a way what you need. Um, and I think that for those people uh, who are working on it uh, and are in the room here, we do like to link because we need to move. Yeah, no time to lose. Uh, not everybody is in COP26, but I think we are uh, moving for that. Uh, I saw an uh, can I move to another question? I saw another hand. Hi, Wart van Es from the Netherlands. I think it's it's a bit related to this question, but a bit more on a negative side. Is the Kate the the, the map you showed of the world where the cell line is impacting most? Um, so, what do you think that the impact will be on those countries in the coming decades if we do not? Uh, suddenly fix this uh, this whole problem. Yeah, thank you very much for that question. It's a very interesting one and it depends um, hugely on the country. So as we see the climate change progressing, of course it can, in some countries, it can exacerbate sal salinization. So we will see that the areas will become more and more saline and that would lead to a number of different problems. For example, farmers having not optimal yields, but also a lot of migration to the cities or to the different areas. Uh, well, problems with the food security, problems with uh, employment. Um, also, very often these people are uh, not in that great uh, financial conditions, so they will have these problems way exacerbated. Um, they very much connect to other, other um, world problems, such as climate change, um, and the COP will also discuss it. We, we were just preparing a side event at the COP to also link these topics, water, climate and salinity. But there are also countries where this is the, the ongoing problem and when they're trying to find solutions. So I would say, uh, yes, of course, with the time, these problems will become bigger and bigger. And also here in the Netherlands, we could slightly see it, let's say two years ago, when there was a dry summer, and then where we already had a bit of um, sea seepage and farmers seeing more salinity than usual. So this is just a little sneak peek of what's gonna happen in 20 years. And now it's time to get prepared and also share so solutions and think about it 
and um, also link to one more barrier that, that appeared a little bit in all our presentations, the social aspect. Because of course we, have, we need capital, we need markets, we need policies, but also, as you did say, farmers are really important and the way they learn. This is also something that I believe Arjen mentioned uh, during one of his presentations. Farmers need to learn from each other. They need to check, okay, they use always this crop. It's not that they will switch to another crop immediately. So having this stable social situation, these connections, this network, uh, that will definitely help in the future. But this also takes time. So I would say that would be the, the impacts that we can expect. Thank you very much. Thank you for that answer. And uh, maybe, uh, does it sufficiently kind of move you to action also? Because action is in a way what we are about, right? Uh, other questions? Yes, please. In the front, could the microphone be here? Thanks, Thanks for your presentation. I'm a student from Till Delft. And um, in, your, in your presentations, I heard a lot of uh, solutions, including the manage, management of uh, land management and policy-wise. Uh, but I'm thinking of, uh, and also like uh, growing of um, saline tolerant plants, but I'm wondering if there's a way to fundamentally solve the saline problem, like soil remediation. Like I'm looking forward to um, your answer regarding this. this, uh, this. Yeah, I guess. Um, probably Arian should yes. start as an expert of salt tolerant crops. Yeah. Well, um, salt affected soils, you can regard them as degraded soils. And uh, you know, soil fertility under saline conditions is usually quite low. So for us, that's always part of the, the mitigation aspect to start revitalizing the soil, you know, uh, organic inputs, start planting cover crops, green manure crops, uh, organic inputs. That always starts to stabilize soil structure, improve overall soil fertility. But it doesn't really take away the, the salinity issue itself. Of course, you can do some drainage and leaching with your irrigation to flush the salts from the topsoil. But where do they go if you leach them? And sometimes it's the salty groundwater that comes up. So, you know, the salts are always there. You cannot just destroy the salts or remove them permanently. You know, the majority of the water in the world is uh, saline water, of course. No, fresh water is very scarce. But also nature knows that, you know, there are a lot of uh, organisms, plants adapted to salinity. So we always focus a little bit more on the adaptation aspects and really taking away salinity. Yeah, if you have a lot of money, technical solutions are always there, especially if you're in a, a more humid climate like in the Netherlands. So here we have a lot of danger of salinity, but we always keep it at bay, uh, even in the dry summers, but it's becoming a bit tricky. But I think the majority of the salt affected lands in the world, they don't really have an option regarding high cost investments to really take care of salinity. So I think adaptation makes more sense there, but where prevention and mitigation makes sense is cost effective. It's always part of the, the, the overall solution for sure. Yeah, I would maybe just add that a lot depends on the soil, soil properties that you have, a source of salinity. Um, yeah, whether you have water available, just, just as Irene said, whether this is um, fresh water or salty water, brackish water. So a lot depends on the, on the local situation. Yeah, I'm not sure what, the, it's all already quite elaborate, but uh, I think indeed I would like to stress what Arjen said, really removing all the salts, it's, it's in the rocks, it's in the, in the natural geology of the, of the, the world. So you can only in, uh, manage the human uh, induced salinization. And you can also, of course, then uh, also do the adaptation and the mitigation. So yeah, I'm sure more technologies will come up as we go and think about the problem. So maybe you will be the one uh, to solve it. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. So we are looking on the one hand of kind of more efficient use for the existing available freshwater source, as well as on the uh, adaptation side, that if the situation is saline, then what can you do about it? Uh, are there more questions? I saw a hand there in the back. Yes, please. Yes, thank you. I just have a question concerning the investment. Is uh, growing... Um, saline uh, crops, is that more expensive than conventional ones? Okay, I'm going to give this question to Arian. Yeah, my mic uh, oh, still works, yeah. 
Um, depends on the, the situation. Uh, as I just mentioned, often we recommend to uh, add extra organic matter. So if a farmer doesn't have his own compost or own manure and he has to start buying organic inputs, that can be more expensive than buying mineral fertilizer. But that's uh, an investment in advance that will pay off uh, later. But still, for a farmer, it's a direct investment often. And if that's too costly for a farmer, you know, yeah, then it's also yeah, the, the whole cultivation becomes too expensive. Um, sometimes the best crops are the, the latest varieties from expensive breeding programs. And usually those seeds or, or seed potatoes are more expensive than the, the open source varieties. So that can also add to the extra cost. But for instance, in Bangladesh, when farmers start buying the new seeds, their yield increased so much that still their income, overall income, also increased. So again, it depends on the situation. What do you have to do regarding prevention, mitigation, adaptation? And is that still cost effective? So it, it differs a lot from place to place. And only changing your crop variety usually is the cheapest way of handling with, uh, with the problem. Thank you very much. And kind of the answer, like what you give is the field level answer. But when you think about of, of kind of landscape level, and that if you have for a certain area, you have to kind of change the water management, then that is also, of course, an investment, yep. but not so much at the kind of farm level. Then it's more at the kind of, well, regional level or the national level. And then it's often a government issue. So then it's a different uh, investment that you need. Does this answer your question? Thank you. Uh, any final question? Or you are kind of waiting for the next session? No, one final question coming from the back. Um, it's about engagement. Um, what, okay, I'm 40 something years old. I became aware of a vegetable called samphire like two or three years ago only. It was delicious in the plate, some sort of vegetable, very salty, grows in the, on the seaside. And um, when you talk about salt resistant crops and all that, I was not aware that that stuff even existed and could be in my plate. Now the, the question I have is, could it bring something to show people what if you change what you got in the menu? What if you put samphires instead of salad? I don't know if salad is salt resilient or not, but what would be the impact of changing your menu and can you add that to your restaurant list? Okay, thank you very much for your question. I'm going to give this question to Judith and to ask to reflect on how you change the food system in that regard. <laughs> can you say something about that? Yes, I'll try to. I think I, some, there are already some culinary uh, producers or culinary people already doing that. So they're already working with indeed saline products. So it's, I'm not sure where um, that will, how does it exactly connect to the restaurants, but I know they already start growing these stuff for the restaurants. And uh, yeah, so it only needs to be upscaled again, I guess, and maybe made more aware uh, that it's indeed a saline product and that's really good to use. Like Arjan said, the sweet carrots can be really nice for the restaurants. And uh, I think a little bit more pr promotion and awareness should be uh, part of the process, I would say. Thank you. I would be very happy to add to that because just this summer we actually did um, a little project here in the Netherlands on the Isle of Terschelling where we were asking people, uh, the clients and customers of the restaurants, how they like, uh, well, a couple of different plants, a salicornia, ice plant, uh, sunfire, and a few other things that they can find and can be added to their plates and how do they, how do they like them. A lot of people find them novel. Uh, they really like them as a little spice or something to add. Um, chefs were also very eager in using them, so they, they already have them in the menus. They said that the biggest problem right now is the supply chain because they are seasonal, so they are not always grown well here in the Netherlands when they are needed, and they have to source them from outside, which is not always so sustainable. So the biggest um, challenge for them is basically to secure the supply, but um, it seems that clients and customers are ready and they really like it. So that's promising. Thank you very much. The supply chain. Yeah, so it's not only the salt, it's not only the water, it's also the supply chain. 
Okay, thank you very much for those answers. Uh, there may be more answers, uh, but uh, I have been asked to be very strict on the timing. Uh, I think we can conclude that there are uh, a number of cases going on in uh, saline water and food systems, that action is needed, uh, and that this action is already taken uh, in various places, uh, but that, that, that it would benefit from linking initiatives and linking different stakeholders uh, in this area. With that, I would like to conclude this session uh, thanking very much uh, the people of NWP and NFP behind the scenes, uh, Frans, Martijn, Roy, Carlos, and of course, a big thank you to the speakers of today. Uh, and with that, I'd like to thank you for your audience.